Hello, my name is Will Pellerman. I'm a baritone, and I am beyond thrilled to have the privilege of interviewing Dr. Cynthia Cosette Lee as part of the Marshall Opera Oral History Project, and to be able to perform her song, The Martyr. Dr. Cynthia Cosette Lee is an award-winning international composer who has written over 150 works for vocal, chorus, chamber music, opera, orchestra, and musicals. Her compositions have been performed by world-class musicians in Europe, Canada, the United States, and the Caribbean by such illustrious groups as Opera Creole, Orchestra Symphonique du Loire, South Florida Chamber Ensemble, and soon to have a performance by the Marshall Opera Company in New York City. That's me. Dr. Lee, what inspired you to have a career in contemporary classical music composition? Thank you, Will. And I'm so excited to be here with this interview for the Marshall Opera. And thank you for your interest in my music and this question. Um, I believe I always had a strong interest in music as a child. I was very fortunate to have a mother who did see my strong interest in classical music. And as a result, she sought out the best classical musicians in the city of Pittsburgh for me to study classical music with. We had an old piano at home. So um, my first teacher was a piano instructor, a professor at Duquesne University by the name of Carmen Romo. And Mr. Romo made me audition before he accepted me as a student. And we had an old piano at home I would play on sometimes. And so don't ask me what I played for Mr. Romo, but I recall scales or something. Anyway, Mr. Romo did accept me as a student for a few years on the piano. And I was very fortunate to um, have um, him as a, a piano teacher, excellent teacher. Um, a few years later, now I was eight years old starting the piano, 10 years old, I began the flute. And uh, my first formal flute teacher was a retired Pittsburgh Symphony member by the name of Alois Raybach. Mr. Raybach was a nurturing teacher. He was just perfect for me as a child learning the flute. Then after that, a few years later, I was fortunate to be connected with the Pittsburgh Flute Club. And I... Um, submitted one of my flute compositions, a flute duet, to one of their contests, and I received honor honorable mention. From that, they decided to give me uh, free composition lessons with uh, Joseph Wilcox Jenkins, who was professor of co at composition and theory at the uh, Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. So it's very fortunate I had excellent classical music teachers to start out my uh, classical music career. Now, at the same time, I'm a product of the Pittsburgh Public Schools. So shout out to the Pittsburgh Public Schools. Um, I had two excellent teachers. One was Marie Mollers in at Grandview Elementary. She formed the first orchestra for children in the city for elementary age school children. And I played the flute and the violin in Marie Moeller's Grandview Orchestra. After that, I went on to Knoxville Junior High School, had an excellent music teacher and orchestra director, Mr. Paul Lawrence Peeler Sr. And Mr. Peeler, years later, I learned that he was the first Black teacher to be hired by the Pittsburgh public school system. And he was one of the first Blacks to receive a music degree from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Now, Carnegie Mellon or CMU is my alumni. That's where I went to undergraduate study. So uh, also on top of Mr. Peeler, I was taking violin lessons with a Charles Lee belt. My oldest sister, Hazel, was taking violin lessons with Charles Lee belt. Also, Mr. Lee belt was a retired member of the Pittsburgh Symphony. So at the same time, having private lessons, here I am in, in the elementary and junior high school uh, receiving all of these 
a training. Um, the Pittsburgh Flute Club also awarded me something called the Victor Sodak Scholarship, which allowed me to obtain free lessons as a teenager with Bernard Goldberg, who was the principal flautist of the Pittsburgh Symphony. So I believe that's where all my classical music passion came from and training. And um, that's how I entered into the world of classical music and decided to become a composer. Thank you for that question. Well, you're very welcome. That's really interesting. I had no idea that you played so many instruments. <laughs> um, how did you become interested in composing opera? Well, I, I think it was a series of first events and doors opening in my life in the city of Pittsburgh where I was growing up. Um, my first opera experience was seeing the televised version of Minotti's opera, Amo and the Night Visitor. And when I saw Willis Patterson, the African-American bass baritone, sing and perform as one of the three kings in Minotti's opera, I believe the years were 1963 to 1965. Uh, and as a result, I was just so thrilled at seeing my first opera with the Alma on the Night Visitor. Also, Minotti, Giancarlo Minotti ended up being sort of like a beacon in my life. Um, he was a very well known and he could not only write music, but he wrote his own libretto for all of his operas. And that was sort of unusual during that time period for a composer to come along, even though Wagner did that. Uh, in during the Romantic period, but um, Mr. Minotti was very talented. Um, also, uh, years later, I did meet the composer, Mr. Minotti, several times after opera performances in Philadelphia. And also, he taught at the Curtis Institute of Music, and occasionally I would accidentally bump into Mr. Minotti um, in the Rittenhouse Square Park at some times. Now, Meanwhile, at Carnegie Mellon, I studied with a role in Like, who was classmates with Giancarlo Minotti and Samuel Barber when they were young students at the Curtis Institute of Music. So when I met Mr. Minotti, I would always say, oh, Mr. Minotti, and I'm, I'm a former student of, uh, of uh, Mr. Like. And so oh, Roland, tell Roland to write me. So um, apparently my teacher, Mr. Like, and Mr. Minotti kept a lifelong acquaintance um, because of that. But um, I was really excited to, to see that first opera by Minotti. Another first experience was seeing my first live opera, and that was with the Pittsburgh Opera. Opera. I was fortunate to know the daughter of the lighting and stage director for the Pittsburgh Opera, and I would volunteer at times to be on the properties committee. Well, I was backstage and I would see the singers rehearsing. I would see the wardrobe and costume, the lighting and the stage crew, a prompter usually. Sometimes the conductor would come backstage. There were musicians, and this all just excited me. And, oh, I was so impressed. I said, hmm, I think one day I'm going to be a composer of operas. But the only thing that was missing, Will, was I didn't see many Black characters. I had heard about Willis Patterson. I had heard about um, Marian Anderson being opera singers, but I really wasn't seeing it. So I decided, hmm, well, when I grow up and I write operas, I'm going to try to concentrate on Black things and stories. So that's sort of where all the opera experience came from. And uh, I'm very fortunate to have that rich experience growing up in Pittsburgh. It was very impactful for me. And uh, thank you again for asking that question also. <laughs> You're very welcome. Well, um, can you tell us the story of the song, The Martyr? Well, The Martyr began as a poem. A poem written by my older sister, Dr. Hazel Ann Lee, who is an accomplished writer and poet. Uh, Hazel went to an exhibit at the uh, August Rodin Museum in Philadelphia. Rodin was a famous French sculptor, and there's a, an, uh, a, a statue there titled The Mark. Hazel decided to write a poem about it. A few years after that, I set the poem to music in an art song. Now, um, the art song I decided was to create it for a baritone voice. I, I was going to do soprano. I said, no, 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 the martyr's going to be for a baritone voice. So 
I included this song, The Martyr, in a series of other songs in a song cycle titled The Three Tributes. Well, after that, I said, hmm, that martyr is very powerful. Why don't I create an orchestral version for the martyr where the baritone is singing with the full hundred piece orchestra. So the next project I did was setting the martyr to uh, music with orchestra accompaniment. I submitted this score and took a Mu Phi Epsilon. It was music sorority back then, it's fraternity now. National Composition Contest and won second prize. The judge of the competition gave the martyr second prize. And I was just thrilled, particularly when I um, I had submitted the work anonymously. You had to cover your name and he did not see my name or know who I was. The judge was Dr. George Walker, who later, years later, became the first Black who received the Pulitzer Prize in music. And I was also thrilled because Dr. Rocker attended the Curtis Institute of Music as a youth, and he studied under someone by the name of Rosario Scalero. Now, Rosario Scalero is a very important figure in composition history, and I'm going to give you a little history lesson to explain why. Um, I had two professors who went to Curtis Institute of Music and studied under Scalero. That was Roland Like, as I said already, at Carnegie Mellon, who was at Curtis with Minotti and Barber. A composition professor at the University of Pennsylvania, George Rockberg, was a student at Curtis under Rosario Scalero. During the first half of the uh, 20th century, many young composers sought after Rosario Scalero as a composition teacher because there was a student teacher lineage or relationship going on historically that led all the way to the period of Franz Joseph Haydn. And I'm going to explain further. Rosario Scalero was a student, a composition student of a uh, Eusebius Mandachewski. Eusebius Mandachewski was a musicologist and a composer and also a personal friend of Johannes Brahms and his music copyist. Johannes Brahms studied with a German composer by the name or Austrian uh, by the name of Edward Markson. Edward Markson was a student of a Ignaz von Seyfried. And von Seyfried was a student of Mozart. Mozart was a student of Franz Joseph Haydn, or we call them Papa Haydn, or the founder of the symphony. So Rosario Scalero sort of represented, if you, ha you have grandparents and everything, well, he sort of represented maybe the fourth or fifth grand, 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 grandson composition student from the time of Franz Joseph Haydn. And this was a German school of composition that was coming down. And I won't go into that because there are French schools of composition, there are Italian schools, but um, basically Rosario Scalera was known for that. And I just felt so fortunate when Dr. Walker chose my piece, The Martyr, as an award. Now I'm not finished with The Martyr, back to The Martyr. So after that, a few years later, my sister and I wrote an opera, Parkway to Freedom, uh, a Civil War opera based on the uh, life and inspiration of my great grandfather, Warren Garner, who fought in the United States colored troops during the American Civil War. And the martyr had such a powerful message. We said, hmm, why don't we take it and turn it into an aria for this opera? Now, the difference between an uh, uh, an art song, an aria would be normally an art song, as you know, as a singer, is for voice and usually piano traditionally, although today in contemporary times, it can be for other accompaniments. The aria is a longer song. Um, it's usually a little bit more demanding than an art song for a singer. And then traditionally, it would be accompanied by a full orchestra or a chamber orchestra. So we decided to place the martyr into, it went from art song to um, aria in the opera. We added some verses also. So that's sort of the story of the martyr. <laughs> and thank you for that question also. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to young upcoming composers? 
Oh, okay. Well, um, that, that's a very good question. You know, I've written four operas. Uh, two, I wrote my own libretto, two, and that was Adea and the Black Qatar. Uh, part of the Adea has been performed by the Opera Creole in New Orleans. They did do an excerpt of Adea last year. And then I have two operas I collaborated with my sister with the libretto, Hazel, my older sister, and they are titled, I said, the Partway to Freedom, and also the um, opera we're working on that's in progress is Let Courage Be the Light. Well, the advice I would give to any composer of any age, uh, upcoming or however, I would just tell you to be yourself, believe in yourself. Um, you have to realize music is a universal language. You can communicate with music anywhere in the world. And as a composer, you have a very important place in all of this. Um, you may have to try different styles or different genre, genres, excuse me. But it's about finding your own voice in music. And in finding your own voice as a composer, sometimes it can be hard. I recall back in the 1970s, when I was an undergraduate and graduate school, it was like a war going on between the atonal avant-garde composers and you had the other composers in the um, um, that may be tonal. They may have been uh, impressionistic. Uh, there was serialism out there, twelve tone music. There were um, um, computer composers, composers who are just starting working with the computer and electronic music also. Uh, a lot of the composers felt that that was the new wave of things. So I was very fortunate to know, you know, I've got to follow my heart. And I went to the University of Pennsylvania to study under George Rockberg because Mr. Rockberg had been there with the serialism in the 12 tone and he had changed over to back to tonality in his music. So I would felt very fortunate as a young composer coming along to find someone. And also George Crumb was very sensitive to the fact that I'm a lyrical composer. Um, I use harmonies and melodies. I'm a traditional composer. And I sort of stayed the course because I had to follow my voice. And that's what being a composer is about, finding your voice. It's a long journey, but that's what you must do. And don't be deterred by, you know, what the left or the right says or whatever. You have to believe in yourself strongly and follow your own heart. So, Thank you. <laughs> so about following your own voice, I'm really fascinated about these librettos that you've written. And I just... How does one write an opera and also write the write the words to it? I'd love to know more about this. Okay, well, opera is I I I I believe it's just telling a story. And as a child, I love to read stories, fantasy stories. Um, I recall Mr. Like, my composition teacher at Carnegie Mellon, telling me, "Oh, you know, you sort of." Um, um, remind me of Minotti. He used to come to our lessons that Barbara and I were sitting in and show Mr. Scalera stories he had set music to. So it's basically just starting with the story and then the words follow and then, you know, the music comes along also. Now, my sister and I did write two musicals when we were younger, you know, at teenagers, and just for some fun. But um, as a result, I did end up a, a contemporary composer of opera and I write in a, a, a lyrical bel canto style. So thank you for that question. Of course, of course. Uh, what are your plans for the future? Well, oh my, I have so much planned. I have um I have a um uh on my website, uh, I'm going to be publishing my own music. So I'll be my own publisher. Uh, I I'm not telling you the name of the company yet, but um I'm very excited because this year my music will become available finally to the public. I have you know, all sorts of music. And if you're interested, my catalog will be out hopefully in a few months. And you just have to go to www.cynthiacosetley.com for that. Also, I hope to uh, publish independently produce my first EP album, and that will be me performing my solo flute and piano works. Um, now, I've been fortunate as a lyrical composer to have the opera, 
uh, Creole in New Orleans before my music. Also, the Orchestra du Laure last year in Paris, France, uh, performed my p work for voice and string orchestra titled The Wake. And that was selected by African Lyric Opera to be sung by all of the finalists in their competition. Also, um, last year, the Detroit River Promise Flute Trio was composed by me as a commission piece for the Detroit. It's called the Crescendo Detroit. And it's a wonderful after school program. So shout out to Crescendo Detroit and shout out to Opera Creole and also the Orchestra du Laure. In addition, I have a young lady in Romania who's using me this year as the topic of her doctoral dissertation, and she will be examining my music in her dissertation. So I feel very honored at that to have flute players all over the world and musicians all over the world interested in my music. And I also have an award-winning Nigerian treasures flute work that has become very popular among professional flutists. So again, I've been very fortunate and I'm excited about April when Will, you will be performing my aria, The Martyr, uh, in performance at the Lincoln Center, uh, New York Public Library, Bruno Walter Auditorium for the Marshall Opera Project. And thank you for those questions. <laughs> You're welcome. So I'm really curious why uh, you haven't been sucked into this atonal, contemporary, you know, kind of composition like so many others. Yes, yes. And again, it was very hard to stay my course. But um, I again, I had very sensitive nurturing teachers. I had been through Roland Like, I had been through George Rockberg and George Crumb that really provided a foundation. And as I mentioned before, Giancarlo Minotti and also Samuel Barber. Oh, at Juilliard School, I was able to study one year with uh, Arnold Arnstein, who was the professional music copyist for many composers, Giancarlo Minotti, uh, Samuel Barber, Leonard Bernstein. So I, I, and we struck up a lifelong relationship because we happened to share the same birthday, October 19th. So um, that was a wonderful experience uh, in uh, uh, knowing Mr. Arnstein and, and relating to him about uh, music problems with copying because the copyist is very important in the composer's life. So I really, really am, am so thrilled again to, to be here today with the interview with you. And I look forward to collaborating with you um, with The Martyr. And I'm sure it will be a wonderful experience. And thank you for everything. You're very welcome. Well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm working with you this Saturday. And yeah. And I'm also a violinist. So if you want to write anything. <laughs> sing at the same time i'd be really okay oh thank you for that that's an idea <laughs> okay but thank you again will I'm, I'm honored thank you thank you thank you so much and i'm gonna say goodbye now okay <laughs>